Mr. Gary Griffith. Mr. Gary Griffith, welcome. How are you? Good afternoon, Anselm. Always my pleasure. Good afternoon to you and to your many listeners and viewers. Oh, how, how, you, how are you going today, Mr. Griffith? Not too bad at all. Yes. Well, all good on, on Easter week, weekend. What, what, what do you and your family do on Easter? Well, we actually, uh, I'm a Catholic, we, we go to church. Um, and then, well, because this is a, a different type of Easter for us, I mean, we are smack bang in the middle of preparation for a general election. So it, it wasn't as, as the usual Easter weekends where we'll probably just stay together, relax, and do very little. There's a lot that we've been doing over the last few days. So the, the, the period for this wind down has allowed us to do a lot to prepare us as we go into the new week after Lent and to prepare for the upcoming general election. Now, uh, Mr. Griffith, you have told everyone that you are strategic. You're very strategic in your move and the things that you do. I, I, it's something that you say very often. What was the strategy in you coming out in front and telling the people that you're going up and run for St. Joseph? <laughs> well, I, I don't think there's more, there's so much strategy, there's more common sense. Okay. The reason why political parties are formed is, is to take part in an election. I have seen so many political parties formed, and then just before election, they, they do not take part, probably because they know they may not have that support, probably because they, they know that, they, that it can be embarrassing, but that doesn't matter. The right of all political, the reason you form a political party is one, to get in government and obviously two, to win and to represent the people who support you. So that being the case, if it is that we know that there's a general election, why, why should you as a political party have to wait until the bell is called to automatically you now try to announce your candidate and then try to play catch up? Especially when you have persons who are present members of parliament who already have their foot on the ground, they, they, must, they must not have a head start. So that being the case, you would have seen as soon as I made this announcement, Terrence Dial Singh has all of a sudden, he has learned about Instagram and social media and every single day is easier showing people historical um, facts of St. Joseph Singh, something he has never done in the 12 years he has been a member of parliament. So he has now picked up himself and, and that shows that what we did was the correct thing to do, not just for, for the NTA trying to be successful, but to get a member of parliament to get off his chair and to start going out there and showing to the public who put him in office that you're there to serve them. So, so you think, you think, um, since you announced that you have put, well, I don't know if Terence yeah, Yassin will be the, nomina the nomination. No, for, yeah, 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 we, we don't, you know. But, 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 but with that, Mr. Griffith, does that mean to say that, are you, are you still in a coalition with the UNC? Well, there was, there was a strategic alliance, I should say, during the local government election campaign 2023, and it was very successful. Um, the concept of trying to use the 77 is as ridiculous as you can come. Several of those PNM seats, PNM won by 310 to 220 and all of that. And other seats that the UNC may have won would have been like 2,000 to, to 800. So that 77, uh, it, it, you had to look, when you look at the 190,000 to 130,000, that's a 60,000 difference, which means that for every five people who voted, three voted for the UNC NT Alliance and two voted for the PNM. That's bad licks. So it showed that it was successful. What happens after going into a general election is a different ball game. Uh, obviously, dialogue would take place. I would always like to believe that if something is working, you don't need to fix it. Um, if it is persons have a change in opinion and they would like to do their own thing, that is not my business. That um, We are a responsible political party. I, the reason why we have that word alliance at the end is to put an alliance of minds of persons with similar views that ideology that we can come together, whether it be persons within the NT, but also political parties uh, external to the NT. So if it is that we see that there are other political parties that are willing to work with us, understand the relevance of us, respect us, and making sure that there's mutual respect, that window will continue to be open. But as at this time, our focus is on the NT, not what other parties intend to do. Right, so, so this was not focus, whatever, anybody else was going to be doing in St. Joseph. This was a basically NTA focus of as we go forward to the general election. Yeah, yeah, correct. So, for example, you know, the UNC, they have all this stated from since November. They are putting up, they are opening the doors there for candidates of all 41 seats. That certainly doesn't sound like a, a party that wants to be in an alliance, but it is their right. If the, the reason you're a political party or the main opposition party 
It is your right to, to look for candidates in all 41. Similar to the NT, it is our right. If going, coming down to the end, when that nomination day is called, and the NT may have 41 and the UNC may have 41, there could be a decision that both parties, um, if they, we feel that there's no type of an alliance and understanding or mutual respect, both parties can go the way of 41 seats each, or a unification where they will be give and take, where certain seats that the that the you would be think that we have a better UNC candidate, the NTA candidate can now support that UNC candidate to win and vice versa. When that is done, as, I, as I've always said, it is a, it is 100% confirmed that the PNM will always lose. That is what happened in 1981, 1991, and 2010, uh, where it is that one party steps back, provides the support of that base supporters in for the other party's candidate and vice versa. Um, St. Joseph was a perfect example. When St. Joseph is split, down the middle, um, you had in 2007, the UNC getting 4,500 odd votes and the same thing with the COP and the PNM got 7,000. And then when you add the, when you did the maths in 2010, join it together with the UNC putting up their candidate, that COP support of the 4,000 join with that. And then it, it becomes a, a greater synergy of, of, um, of the numbers game. So it's not just adding the both. It's, the, it's the saying the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So by that happening, it caused um, ju previous Justice Volney to totally annihilate um, um, Major Kennedy Swartz in 2010. So, so, so what I'm hearing you saying, Mr. Griffith, is that the door is still open for an alliance in the general election between the NTA and the UNC. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and that is for all the other political parties, as I said. Um, the, the perception that, okay, there are three major political parties, two, obviously, the PNM and the UNC, and the NTA is, that, is seen now as that party that is trying to re represent that bridge constituency of the previous ONR slash NAR slash COP voters. So you notice every few years, we just keep changing the name. So probably in 10 years, there may be something else instead of the NT. It doesn't take away the fact that that representation has always been the catalyst to decide the outcome of the, of the election. And so obviously, the door will be open if there continues to be dialogue. And I think that is what the country wants. The country wants to see some type of unification and alliance of different minds and not just probably one political party running a government. But, but, but Mr. Griffith, don't you think that it will be better if it's the NTA against the PNM as opposed to be the NTA UNC against the PNM? No, but many, many people, Anson, many people have told me that, um, especially in the corridor. You have this bitterness that you will have people or for the UNC, just as you'll have people with bitterness for the PNM. Uh, but I, I have to be honest and do the maths. I mean, on, it, it started, as I said, it started in 1981 with that third party getting 91,000 votes, no seat that was where our 1991, it moved to the NAR, of which Kamala Prasad Bissessa was a candidate against the UNC. And they got 127,000 votes against, um, and, uh, against the PNM and they got no seats. And then in 2007, the COP then moved up to 147,000. So the numbers keep growing. Um, do we have that capacity to win an election on our own? What we have seen is that bridge constituency, on most occasions, it will comprise just about two thirds odd of the persons who will, be, who will vote for the UNC if there's no third party. But that one thing that goes back to the PNM is what will cause the flip over for the PNM to defeat the UNC. The UNC have never been able to defeat the PNM in a three horse race. The UNC has never been able to defeat the PNM on its own at any time other than one occasion and that only lasted a few months. So, uh, yes, it is that many people will say that, but and that is based on emotion. I cannot, I don't make decisions based on emotion. Uh, I'm like Spock in Star Trek. You have to be very clinical, you have to be very analytical, and you can't just do it based on, we don't like this one, or we hate this one. You can't. No political party is perfect. No political leader is perfect. I am certainly not perfect. And what I'm willing to do is to embrace, to open, to, to unify. So, so often in politics, we have seen, especially like you mean with the PNM, the political leader of the PNM, every single thing he says, notice his words, I have directed, I have instructed, I have summoned, I have ordered. Those are his words. And he actually believes that is what a leader, leadership is about. And then every comment is to attack Gary, to attack Kamala. The country doesn't want that. The country wants to see a united country. And that is why it, is, it was so good when this country just 20 years ago with people like Pat, Bas Pandey and Patrick Manning, whoever was in government, the country did not have this type of hatred and bitterness and animosity that line being drawn. My intention is to unite Trinidad and Tobago. And as much as people will be upset and saying we must not talk to any other political party because we believe that we are so much better than them, 
I think that's what caused the disenchantment and the defeat in 2007 because there was that perception that the COP felt that they were better than anyone else. It doesn't. You can't disrespect that PNM base. That is a very powerful party that have done so much for Trinidad and Tobago. I am not going to, to attack and condemn and demonize the PNM. Similar to the UNC, there's a very powerful base. These two parties have a base of 150,000 plus, regardless of what the political leader say or do, they are going to support it. And uh, this is not about calling them sheep. This is what happens to the Republicans and Democrats in the United States. It happens. And when you have that base so solid, you, they start off with 150,000 head start over that third constituency. Having said that, the decision that the third constituency, that bridge constituency make, is the, always the deciding factor towards the, the election results. But, but, but Gary, just, just, just to follow up, this is the last one from Mr. Tupin. Do you honestly believe that if you go it alone, that you can have an impact in the upcoming general election if you just go it alone without that coalition between the UNC and the other smaller parties against the PNM? When you say impact, impact as in successful impact? or <laughs> Well, winning seats then, winning seats to have an impact. Well, and again, that's why we, we honestly don't know. When, when you look at um, 2000, 2007, the Congress of the People got 147,000 votes. The UNC got just about 40,000 more. So that's about that's a difference of twenty thousand persons had they decided to vote for the COP instead of the UNC, uh, the, the COP would have probably acquired more votes or seats. Sorry, the UNC instead got fifteen seats. The COP got none. But what happened since two thousand and seven? <clears throat> Seventeen years later, persons between the ages of eighteen and thirty-five never had a third choice. Um, those young people are those who mommy and daddy can't tell them this is a PNM or UNC house. You have to vote for us because of the era of technology. Young persons are no longer caught up in this is a PNM or UNC house. That is why that bridge constituency in the numbers continue to build drastically. And because of that, unless which is very sad, you know, I'm not saying this is very sad that we have the all of our daily newspapers and media houses in the last ah uh, geez, about the last eight years, there's never been a poll on anything. The only poll they've ever done is on Gary Griffith. When in that poll with myself as commissioner of police. <clears throat> Uh, there was 89% public trust and confidence in me. You had no concern about me, which I think was the highest of any citizen in Trinidad and Tobago. But that was as a commission of police. Is that 89% going to resonate into politics? Definitely not. Because there are many people, PNM and UNC, till they die, that said in that 89% that said, yeah, I believe in Gary Griffith. But for him to be in a political party, nah, mad what? As a PNM or UNC till I die, no way. So that unless there's a poll, a scientific poll that was done, the only one that was scientific in the local government had PNM with 39%, UNC 35%, the NTA 10%, 9 or 10%, other parties 1%. And that is where when we realize the 9 plus the 35 will overwhelm the 39 of the PNM. And it's exactly what happened in the local government. But that was that was in November last year. Things changed. So it remains to be seen whether we have that capability. I, 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 I say I don't work based on gut feeling. I try to be very analytical, clinical, and that could oh, that answer could only be given if there's a scientific poll done. So uh, you mentioned something there, and it kind of jogged my memory. Of that. Are you open to a political debate of the um, political leaders in Trinidad and Tobago? For example, in this country, we have about three, I think, three presidential debates. All right, and even in the Democrats, they have debates too as well, and the Republicans also have debates. I don't remember the last time that there was any debate in Trinidad and Tobago with any of the political leaders running to be prime minister. Are you open to something like that? A hundred percent. I said it recently with Fitzgerald Hines when um, uh, so he was on an interview in a, in a state media house, and they asked him, would you be willing to have a debate with Gary Griffith? He said yes. And obviously, the coward that he is, after two months, he has refused to take me up on it. He's a coward. I will. I, I could debate with him on anything, especially if it comes to national security, where he's a minister. I was a previous minister. Let's go. Let's deal with policies, plans, programs, political will, technology, unit systems, um, methods to improve performance, measure performance, making the police service accountable. He doesn't have a clue. He and 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 my results as a minister to his, I would have annihilated him. So. This is, this is the problem why it will not take place. Keith Rowley will not dare have a debate with me because he's the only one who has anything to lose. He already has his 150,000 base that, that really and truly believe that he is the best person to be prime minister. 
So if he debates with me, all that is going to happen is that I'm going to expose his shortcomings. Uh, I will hit certain trigger points and will, and will cause him to get upset. His head will start going up and down like this when he, you know, when he gets upset. And he start, and he start making comments of yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't know what that means. Only Keith Rowley could translate the things that he says when he gets angry, upset. He, as Patrick Manning said, he gets totally out of control. Being trained at a military academy, I will know how to press his trigger points and he'll, he, will, he will flop. So he is never going to have a debate with, with me um, because he doesn't see the value of it, which again is unfortunate. I support you 100 percent that there should be some debate so that the country can actually see. Let us see who is going to be the better individuals to serve us. But it wouldn't happen, not in Trinidad and Tobago. We are not mature enough because we do not see the value or the, the persons who hold high office will see that this is only going to affect me. So there's no value for me to recognize him and give him enough oxygen to measure our standard. It is going to diminish my my support, so I'm not going to do it. So in other words, he, they, 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 are, they are cowards and they will not do it. And the sad thing is that if you switch and you're in opposition, you'll want to have a debate because you want to take, you want to go after the person who is in government. He, you know, we, if that one who holds the crown, it, it's a, the, the, what can I say? It's a, it is lonely at the top, but the view is excellent. And that's why everybody wants to have that view. But to be able to come out and debate to show your worth, ain't gonna happen. Well, why, why don't the people of Trinidad and Tobago call for that? Because you know what? Where's your eye at this? We, Trinidad and Tobago compare themselves to many things happening in America, right? When we want to compare it for whatever it is good, you know, we never compare ourselves to the, to, 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 the, to the bad things. We compare ourselves to the best of the best, right? A debate is the best of the best, right? Why don't the people of Trinidad and Tobago call for those political leaders to have debates? It's, it's required in a, in a general election. Well, I, I think they do. I think they want that um, because, as I said, the many PNM su um, supporters would actually believe that Keith Rowley is a good leader. And so they will want that and not, and, not, and not until the debate starts that they will realize, my God, this man doesn't have a clue. So the vast, the vast majority of the country will always want it. Uh, when it is that um, message was passed and had Fitzgerald and said, yes, he's willing to have a debate with me. The whole country said, yeah, let's do it. So the public will want it. But what happens is that when you get in office, you ignore the needs of the public. You ignore the concerns, the views, the wishes of the public because you, you, you actually think that they are sheep. So that I am, even though they want to have this debate, I'm not going to do it because it's going to affect me politically. And they do not want to actually expose their shortcomings. So the, the public, by and large, will want it. They would, they would, be, they would be excited to see a debate like that. But it, as I said, it won't happen because even though the public may demand it and want it, the persons, especially who, in authority, I don't think there's ever been a prime minister. I can't recall that. Yeah, there hasn't been a prime minister in this country that has ever agreed to have a public debate with the leader of the opposition or leaders of other political parties. What they do is what you have right now with um, conversations with the Prime Minister, which is really misinformation with the Prime Minister. He has choreographed persons come forward. It was hilarious. I actually exposed it to show that the man is not, he's not, Keith Rowley is a fellow, he's not comfortable of him, with himself. He's not sure of himself. He has a lot of shortcomings. So what he did, what they did was get people to prepare questions. And this man had a whole spoke for about three minutes. And then Keith Rowley says, Oh yeah, you know, and they did this. Oh, well, let me answer that and press it and, and press. He had the answers of the exact question, and it took him 0.5 seconds to press. It was there on his phone waiting to be answered. So that whole ultimate conversation with the prime minister is not the public coming up to you and doing a critical analysis of your performance. You're getting people who are all with a PNM party card or, or supportive of you. They tell you what question to ask, and then you know the answer that you would give to give the impression. Look at me. It, it reminds me of um. He sits down like in, if a person's maybe a little older, um, Sesame Street, there's this fellow called Alistair Mokoki, and he just sits down nearby the fireplace with his legs folded and trying to pretend that you're so calm and controlled. You're, choreo you're not choreographing to fool the public into believing that you know your job. That is what they will do. They will never take a one-on-one -on -one with a critical analysis of even reporters or, um, or other persons in political party. Like, for example, I am the only political leader that would be willing to uh, have a an interview with anyone, and there are serious PNM stations that I would be willing to because I know my business, I know my job. You can't catch me when you ask me a question. I know where you're coming three steps ahead, so I know by if I give that answer, this is what you this is what you're going to come back at me after. So political leaders will not be interviewed in polit in radio stations in Toronto, Tobago that are being that are totally biased towards 
uh, or, or against them. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely hear you. I, but Mr. Griffith, I would like you guys, and I'm saying the NTA, the PNM, and the UNC, when they're having these conferences or these talks that they find a way to get the diaspora involved so that people from the diaspora could ask them questions. You know, because I kind of feel that the diaspora is left out. And we see things from a little different perspective than how people in Trinidad and Tobago see it. You know? Uh, and I, uh, huh? A little, a little. You will see it in a big different perspective because you are outside of it. You know, usually when you're inside, you, yeah. don't, see what, you don't see the problems because you're so blinded by being a, a, a supporter of the red, the yellow, or the blue, or whatever. You actually don't see it. Sometimes when you stay from the outside and you're looking at it, you get a, a more neutral, holistic perspective. And that is why it is important very much so for the diaspora to actually have some degree of contribution. But you all don't. There's nothing that the media will ask what it is that the average citizen in Miami, in New York, in, in Boston, in London, in Toronto would think. No. And, and it even goes to the point of your contribution to even selecting who must govern a country. We have shown total disrespect for the diaspora of all persons who have a Trinidad Tobago passport because we are telling you, we have told you for the last five decades, if you, you are not a true Trini and because for you to come and vote here, you have to leave, I think it's six months in advance, stay here for you to be registered by the EBC. That is total disrespect. And when you look at the numbers, I think it's about 500,000 um, primarily in Miami, New York, um, in uh, Toronto, London, those are the main places. And I think it is so, it's such blatant disrespect, but I, I tell you political parties on both sides, we have always had that concern that you bring, you bring in, we, we allow the diaspora to have equal voting rights, for example, which is what I intend to do when we get in government. We give you all equal voting rights. The yellow may very well say that's dangerous for us because the number of Afro Trinidadians that are in New York, uh, it will be overwhelming. And then the PNM might say the same thing about the number of Indo Trinidadians who have uh, TT passports in London and in, and in um, probably Miami or, or, or Toronto. So they play the numbers game. And because they're not sure if it is going to politically benefit them, they decide to cut you off totally. And I think that is unfair. I don't care. By me, my, my intention is to do the similar thing to the United States citizens. You are a US citizen anywhere in the world. You don't have to get back to the United States to vote. And it is so simple to, be, to, to do. All it takes is two things. One, that you have a Trinidad Tobago passport, but gives you some an, an, an address in Trinidad and Tobago that we can say that this is where you're eligible to vote put it into your constituency. And two, that we put similar systems in the US where we have that those um, temporary uh, stations for um, special voting in Miami, in um, New York, in Washington, in Toronto, in Venezuela, in Caracas, in um, Guyana, um, China, Geneva, and that's and that's how easy it is done. And now you'll be able to get five hundred thousand extra persons to make sure that they are seen, recognized, and given the respect. Because nothing makes you less a Trinidad Tobago citizen than one who lives in Trinidad and Tobago. But that's my view. You no, know, I hear you, and, and and I don't really hear. I don't hear the PNM or the UNC actually talking about the diaspora. You know, and I know at one point in time, some party was saying, nah, we don't want them out in the diaspora voting because they might vote for this party. <laughs> you know, they might That's make this party, they might make this party win, you know. So by any means necessary, we don't want no part of them. If they want to vote or they get on a plane, you know, <laughs> and come back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it so it goes right back to what's in it for me, not treating a Trinidad Tobago citizen as a Trinidad Tobago citizen. I think it is total disrespect to the diaspora. Um, and if it is that the NTA, we do that, and it may cause more persons to vote for, say, the PNM to put them back in office, so be it. It means we have our job to do to influence the diaspora that we are the better party. But it doesn't matter. We can be cutting out uh, probably about one third of the eligible voters with a Trinidad Tobago passport just because you don't live here. That is, I mean, that's real banana republic type of politics we're speaking about. And no prime minister has ever seen it fit to, to do that. But when you're a prime minister, 
you will want to go to all these different places after yeah. to have yeah. the, 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 the flair and the thing. I'm the prime minister and I'll meet with you all and I'll cut a ribbon here and I'll go down to Brooklyn and I'll I will open this new place. But as soon as but when it comes to trying to say to what do you have should you have a part to reappoint me? Uh-uh, no way, because I'm not sure if it is going to shift to cause me to be defeated. Now here's a question from the chat, Mr. Griffith. It says, Mr. Ansem, question to Gary. The country in an economic crisis, do you think the people will choose the third party with no track record to give them a chance to bring back the country or just vote for the UNC? Well, again, the, the, the fact is with no, with no track record, so the first thing I will ask you all is, what have you got to lose? It can't get any worse. So by stating, you know, it's like stating you have a football team that is losing constantly. And then we say, look, instead of us, we, are, we keep losing our World Cup qualifiers because we keep looking for experience. Let's build a national 23 team and develop them. So they at least you know it's going to be young, dynamic, away from all of the, the corruption, the mismanagement, the backstabbing. And it may take a while to build, but, 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 but you're still losing anyway. So what have you got to lose? Nothing. That is one. Two, the, the perception that because a political party does not have the experience, Look at the track record of the experience of the past. Is that what is that the experience you want to read to, to come back for another five years? When it is, you look at myself as uh, I was a minister of national security and my budget allocation was more than any other minister. Um, when I was a commissioner of police, my budget allocation was more than most ministers in the PNM government. So I am fully cognizant in understanding how to balance a budget, how to be able to utilize resources in an effective and efficient manner, how to minimize expenses while it's not affecting productivity. And that's, that's the reason why the police service, for example, we were able, even though they cut our budget by several, by $400 million during the period of COVID when we needed the most, I was still able to get funds to purchase walkthrough um, mobile scanners, body cameras, pepper spray, new units, new technology, new equipment, things to put an end to kidnapping, things to put an end to home invasions. So I was, and that is the same way that what we are trying to show is that if it is that I was able, through my team, transform the Trail Tobago Police Service, utilizing our own limited budget allocation, then it is that we can do the same thing to transform every single arm of the public service. It is not difficult. The transformation of me in the police service was because of my expertise in national security. It had to do with management. It had to do with leadership. It had to do with accountability. It had to do with measuring performance. You do that, you can transform the health, education, finance, youth development, sport, all of these different ministries. You put systems to make sure there is proper accountability. We cut the waste, we cut the fat, and then you don't have to now turn into trying to tax your way out to balance a budget. You know, um, Mr. Griffith, you you'd mentioned sport. I was looking for the Prime Minister to congratulate the hockey team for making the World Indoor Championship. Did he? By by Sam, I, 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 I didn't see anything. Do you know if he did? No, um, and, and that is one of the things that I, I know for the last 50 years again. Sport has never been a frontline ministry. It is going to be a frontline ministry uh, in the next government. I have managed the national hockey team for 10 years. We call we, we got the first time we ever got CAC gold medals. Um, I managed the national women's hockey team that qualified um, for the World Cup finals, um, defeating the United States, in fact, in Washington. I've been on the technical staff of the national men's football World Cup team. I've been on the technical staff with the West Indies World Cup cricket team in, in the T20 in England. So I'm heavily involved in sports, and it's not because I like sport, but I understand that sport can transform, can totally transform a country. This country was never so united as it was after we qualified in that 2006 for the 2006 World Cup. But we don't do anything. We um, even with the World Cup football team, which is usually the most important sporting team in a, in a country, um, or sorry, the soccer team. So and, and with that, the, there was absolutely nothing that was done. Not a finger was lifted to assist the national team in equipment, in, in, um, in uh, practice games, in traveling, in, um, in the access to a field. And it happened with the hockey team as well. This hockey team, they are trying to train in an area where in one place where this rain is falling on the, on, in the, on the um, surface. They rented it out to primary schools. I acquired the only artificial surface in the Southern Caribbean for hockey. And, in that, and with that artificial surface for three years, 
it has not been used. It's at the police barracks because Gary Griffith built it. And this has stopped hockey. For three years, we do not have a hockey a, 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 a hockey co a competition or tournament from the Trinidad Tobago Hockey Board. That is madness. We put no support and emphasis in understanding the importance of sport. Sport doesn't just turn somebody into winning a gold medal. It transforms minds, young minds, into certain character traits that is important involving um, development, uniformity, punctuality, leadership, not giving up, teamwork, strategy, all of those things in sport, when you're on a sporting team, you can now use that into your own personal life to develop you. That's why it is it is less that you will see someone who is uh, involved in sport um, feeling than someone who is not involved in sport. When you're in sport, your whole body, your, the, the system changes. And that is why I intend to make sure that almost every single young person must be taking part in some degree of sport. So sport will now become a core curricular activity, similar to some countries in Europe, rather than be seen as an extracurricular activity. You know, I, I, I am a full first sports player, and it I was taken aback when I saw a young lady from Burnley Athletics getting up and talking to the Prime Minister and telling the Prime Minister, Eddie Hart don't have a locker room for them to change. Eddie Hart Center, Eddie Hart Ground. Mm -hmm. Don't have a locker room for them to change. And the Prime Minister said, well, my Minister of Sports is here. I'm going to see what she can do. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I didn't get that, man. This is 2024. Well, you know, answer that. I'll tell you why. I mean, and it's not to knock the Minister of Sport, but she admitted she never kicked a line. She knows nothing about sport. So when I was Commissioner of Police, I would be trying to get the head of the Normalization Committee, the National Coach, the Minister of Sport to get together, understand the importance of us qualifying for the World Cup. And she just didn't get it. She couldn't understand it. And it is not to say we do not have the funds. When you had a, a and let me tell it in the U.S., a stadium in Brian Lara that is supposed to be constructed at a cost of less than 7 million US. 7 million US for a stadium. That is the cost for similar uh, stadium, uh, a stadium around the Caribbean. They instead paid nearly 200 million US for the same construction. You, you're talking about over nearly 180 to 190 million dollars US in corruption, in mismanagement. You imagine if that was used towards the development of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. Our national teams constantly it happens. The day before they have to leave, you're fighting to see if you can get a cabinet note. Fighting. That will obviously affect the mindset of the players prior to leaving because they don't even know if they're going to take part. And then, and then teams will go now and you have poor accommodation, poor organization. You don't have practice games prior to the, to the, the, the actual tournament. It is a disaster because we, and again, I think going back in the last 20 years, the only three ministers in Trinidad and Tobago who actually have been involved in national sport would have been Arnel Roberts, uh, myself, and I think uh, Gary Hunt. But the rest of them have never kicked a line. They're not in, and it's not a knock them, and not everybody could be involved in sport. But, they, but many cabinets, they do not understand the value of sport. <clears throat> they do not put the emphasis to understand how that can transform not just a mind, but a country. So the Shamfa Kojo, unfortunately, she doesn't know. She doesn't understand. She sees sports as a ministry and a business. Sport is so much more. And that is why, as I said, I intend to make sure that sport becomes a core curricular activity and become one of the primary ministries in the government. You know, I have said, right, in, in our communities here um, in New Jersey, almost every town have a recreation department. <clears throat> and the recreation departments have different sporting activities all throughout the year. And there's also academic activities too. I have said, you know, it would be nice if the 41 constituencies in, around Trinidad and Tobago have a dedicated recreation department, which puts on sporting events 365 days out of the year. You know, because what it does, it allows these kids to come in. When they finish practice, they tire, they go home, they do their homework and they go to sleep. Right? And on weekends, you have events happening. Right? Let me see. Hold a minute. Let me see. Just a minute. Hello, caller. Welcome. Hello, caller. Hello? Okay. Yeah. These recreation departments have had significant impact on these communities. And not only that, but in school, everyone had to play some type of sport. Everyone. Yeah. So... 
Go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's not coincidental. I'm actually looking at myself, and the two major parts of my life have been involved in the two pictures in the back, and it's so coincidental. One is sport, well, one is sport, yeah. and one is military service. And that that is where, again, I, I have seen so much that I said that they have not done what is required. When I was commissioner of police, I understood the importance of sport to transform minds to take them away from a life of crime because there's something in criminological theory known as there's primary, secondary, and tertiary crime prevention. Crime prevention. The primary is hard targeting. That's policing, roadblocks, operations, arresting. Then there's tertiary, which is the criminal justice system. Secondary, it's trying to utilize um, the energies of young persons away from a life of crime, better education, better health facilities, um, and sport. And then as commissioner of police, we did something known as the commissioner's cup. This involved thousands of young persons yeah. being able, this was just to play a, a football game for a tournament to win, you know. What that did is that you will have two different areas in Laventil or wherever, and this football team will now play with this football team. And you're speaking about gang members on the both sides coming and watching the two teams play, and then realizing these are young players in our area, and these are young players in another area. They are all humans, they are all citizens, and they'll be watching their fellow gang members, and it calmed the country down. It allowed not just for a unification of a team, but the unification of one town to another, one village with another, one constituency with another. That is how sport could unite a country. That Commissioner's Cup played such a critical part in calming down certain volatile, known as hotspot areas, by unifying the village, the town, the area, to say, hey, this is our team, we're supporting them. And it built a degree of harmony, um, unification, and even good camaraderie between different areas that would have been seen initially as a war zone between one and the other. As soon as I left, it was shut down because the two commissioners after me never kicked a line. They didn't understand the value of sport. And that is the example of when you speak about what is the NTA going to bring to the table, a total transformation in governance. You know, and that is that is so important. Eh? I mean, I went to the 2006 World Cup eh? because I told myself, the first time Trinidad and Bago make it to the World Cup, I will make sure I'm be there. So yeah. I was there for all of them games. And that was like, that was a splendid first occasion, man. And it, as you said, there was a sort of unification across the country when we made it to the World Cup. Yeah, and, and, and let me tell you something about it. Qual we qualified for the World Cup, it's by it wasn't by a proper national development. It was based on the fact that we had about 10 players who were actually playing in the top leagues in the world. The um Dwight York, uh, Stern John, Brent Sancho, Shaka Hislop, Russell Latapi. They were all there playing at the highest level. Now, because FIFA has changed that you have to your country had to be in the top um 100 or in FIFA. Now all players can't even get to sign to play in the English Premier League. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that, so what we have to do is similar to what Costa Rica, Panama, and even Venezuela have done. You put in, continue to put, the, uh, there's no support whatsoever for our national team, the U teams, the under 15, the under 17, the under 20. We just had an under 20 World Cup qualifying tournament. And the, the team was hurriedly assembled a few months before the tournament. And the reason they're doing it, it is not bad management by the normalization committee or the TTFA, it's because of lack of any type of support by the government. So, I mean, if my son, he was on the national under 17 team, and it was just about two weeks before the qualifier started in Orlando, that they said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna send you all off, go and see what you could do. And they qualified, I think they got, they, 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 they got through to the playoff and they lost in the quarterfinal or something. That shows the disrespect that our government has. These, these teams are supposed to be given as much, you know there's a World Cup, there's a qualifying tournament in a year. Do you, you assemble them in a year, but you said you assemble them in two months and then you blame the poor coach when it is you get bad results. That is the type of incompetence that I have seen constantly with our national teams. And what they do is they just give them enough funding to attend the tournament that they will take part in and lose. No, you got to put a proper structure to make sure that they train. It happens with the US under 15, under 17, under 20 team. It's not because the U.S. players are much better than Trinidad Tobago players, but the mental, physical preparation they get prior to these qualifiers is what will always cause the USA to defeat Trinidad and Tobago. And that is the point that I'm trying to drive home. It's not going to happen with this present administration. Not one of them understand or have been involved in any type of major sport. So they don't know. It is a government that is clueless in understanding the importance of sport towards unifying, building a country, and, and building that degree 
think of harmony, um, the, the pride that you get when your national team wins. And it happens constantly. I remember even um, Kishon Walcott. I went to 2012 Olympics. I, we were, my family and I were about five rows behind Kishon when, when, he, when he threw the javelin. This man was given a javelin and was told, and this wasn't the government to see, but individuals say, look, we let in this javelin, I spent $40,000 for it. Make sure you bring it back after you lose. That is the kind of mental thing you tell. When he wins, there's a big motorcade. And yeah, then yeah. after he wins, he's coming, he's coming back on the same flight with myself, and he's down in economy class, down in the back where the toilet door slams you in your face. And the, I think the head, of, the head of TTOC had to switch seats for him to stay in business class. That is the type of disrespect you see. But then when they arrive, you do everything. Yeah. And it even happens even with the with um, the Miss Universe, uh, with, with people who represent us, even in Miss Universe and Miss World. The individual who represented us in Miss World, you ask the government, show us what did you do to help prepare this young lady towards what she had? What traveling did, did you arrange for her? What type of training for her to be involved in protocol, public speaking, impromptu speaking? What funding did you put to her sister? But as soon, soon, soon as she comes back and got in the top four, all sorts of motorcade and fanfare and ministers reaching at the airport. It happens all the time. That type of disrespect must stop. The, these, these sportsmen don't want to have a plane named after them and, and all of that. What they want is the support from Trinidad and Tobago prior to them representing Trinidad and Tobago. You know, I'm going to say this. In the past nine years, sports have depreciated to its worst ever level in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. I can say that. The worst in the history. And, and here's why I say that to her. You talked about the turf field. When is Daryl Smith, right? Was he Minister of Sports? Is Daryl Smith? Yes, he was the Minister of Sports and, and right. then Tampa Kujo, yes. Right. When he was the Minister of Sports, before you came up with the idea of turf, I came to Trinidad one year. I met him in his office and I brought a sample of turf. I already had talked oh. to the company. I brought a sample, you know. I had already talked to the company. I had known they had put turf down right here in where we live. And I sample and everything. And I say, Mr. Smith, here is something that this government could be innovative, creative with respect to sports. This is something they can plan this 24-7. Rainfall, it go drain out. The people will come and do it. And you know what happened? When, when, when I left, you must find some special garbage that has put turf in and put it in that disposable file. You understand? And then when I hear you come in and say that, I say, wow, that's a brilliant idea. Because in many tongues here, high school have to. High yeah. school. High school. <laughs> high school. I, I mean, and, and there's a reason for that. Because when I look at the concept of putting an astroturf in St. James Barracks, that was taxpayers' money. It cost, it cost the taxpayers about $2 million in comparison to the, to the similar turf being built in Takariba for the last five years has costed about $12 million because I cut the middleman. And when it, and that turf was to be used for all, not just for the national hockey team, not just for um, other sporting teams, but to, to assist the, um, the area in St. James, Port of Spain and surrounding areas to play win world cricket at night, to have all of the children be on a facility that is virtual that it makes there's a less likely chance that they could be injured because of the cushion of that turf. So you can have that turf being used from 8 a.m. until midnight, 20 or every single day with a 10-year lifespan. You're talking about young children playing sports. And you know, for three years, they've refused, refused to give it. That that is a tax, that's taxpayers' turf. The police service, they have been told apparently, do not give it to anybody else because Gary Griffin built it. And that's for three years, anybody who drives in St. James, you will see that turf empty. And it is total disrespect. And let, let me even add, this is what uh, affected the national football team from not even qualifying for the 2022 World Cup. Well, at least getting through to the next round. Because, because what happened is that the national team was supposed to play um, Puerto Rico. And playing Puerto Rico, they had to play Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico on Astro Turf. And yeah. any footballer will tell you, playing on grass, to then play on an astroturf is chalk and cheese. You need to prepare and to have some degree of training on an astroturf before you get out there. Puerto Rico could draw it us, but that is what happened because I didn't get the astroturf completed until a few weeks after the Puerto Rico game. So when the team turned up there in Puerto Rico, they were at a loss. And the same thing happened with Trent Tobago when they played Curacao recently under Angus Eve. Curacao could give us five. It was an astroturf. And 
and, and the astroturf was there, but uh, in, but the, the national team, instead of having the ability to use that astroturf to prepare them, we lost to Curacao. So that goes at the point I'm telling you, the importance of an artificial surface. You put that around different parts of Trinidad and Tobago. You get in all of the primary schools, the young young persons, hockey, wind ball, cricket, 24 hours, 24 hours a day you could use an astroturf. It is not going to turn into dust during, this, during the first six months of Trinidad and Tobago um, season or turn into mud in the last six months in the season of Trinidad and Tobago because the first six months is hot sun and all the grass will die. The last six months, it's total rains, it's going to turn to mud. That's what our field still like. That is how it is in, in, uh, in this part, this neck of the woods. The astroturf, and you see it everywhere you turn in the United States and London, is an artificial surface. Yep. 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 And, 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 you know, it's, it's and on these artificial turf, they just play baseball, they just play lacrosse, they just play football, they just play soccer. I mean, they just play hockey. All these different sports are being played on this astroturf. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we have one is one or two one the yeah. one that the one that was constructed by the police one and and that one is not being utilized it's not being utilized the only the only persons that use it will be the national hockey team and they charge them something like 500 dollars an hour so they can't use it as much as they could it's madness it's ridiculous so hockey that has proven to be i think the most successful sport i can i think in Toronto to be going the last 10 years our national hockey team just qualified for the World Cup finals, the Indoor World Cup finals, defeating yeah. the USA 5-4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The USA 5-4, and, and they had to train in a Woodbrook youth facility with rain falling and having to share with primary schools. Our our other hockey fives team um, were in the World Cup finals, and they reached the quarterfinals of the World Cup finals, losing by one or two goals to Malaysia. So they got in the top eight countries in the world. That is the type of quality that we have in our hockey teams. And you have an art, you have an artificial surface there. And for three years, there's been no national league in Trinidad and Tobago. So obviously, hockey will will die. <clears throat> the younger players have this. There's been no opportunity for them, <coughs> excuse to to develop themselves to take part in competition. And the government is to blame. <coughs> no, no. I, 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 we could talk sports all day because I I I am a sports person too, and I believe sports <coughs> have a significant impact. And I in 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 in. in the, the statistics are there to show that sports help with crime as well. You know. Yeah, definitely. As I said, a young, I, I, you will see on, on most occasions persons who are involved in sport. They usually have camaraderie. They have persons to speak to. <clears throat> they, they will utilize their energies away from a life of crime, and that is why, on most occasions, persons who are involved in sport, there's a less likelihood. I'm not saying it's not happening, but there's a less likelihood than somebody who will just spend the whole day lying on the block not being involved in any teamwork, um, anything for him to stay fit, <coughs> excuse, anything for him to be involved in an activity to develop himself, to motivate himself, the possibility of you becoming a pro league footballer, for example, it may not be much in Trinidad and Tobago, but it takes the, the young persons off of the street. So that is where it is. It is, it is so important. And I just want to make mention, sorry to, to, to segue, but there's a comment that's being made on the line there by a guy said Caribbean soul. At no time have I put out this feeling that both UNC and PNM were corrupted. That is a lie. Throughout this interview, I have never said that. You are putting words in my mouth. What I said is that both parties have done a tremendous job in developing the country, and they have made also mistakes, as many of us would do. So for you to put that line, to say that I put out the feeling that UNC and PNM were corrupted, so you are a liar. So, let, Gary, I want to shift. I want to shift the property tax. Oh, sorry, that, before we go there, the question, how are you going to generate returns from sports strategy? I'll give you a simple example. Guyana got over 100 million U.S. income generated from CPL. When I was Minister of National Security, I gave us a three-year uh, three contract to have the CPL in Toronto and Tobago. When you have 20,000 people in the Queen's Park Oval and they leave the Queen's Park Oval after the game, they go to Arapita Avenue, St. James, the bars, the nightclubs, the taxis, the hotels, the restaurants, it generates income into the economy. That is how you deal with, with, with generating returns from sports. Also, for example, when you have a proper stadium with proper systems, you can now you bring in 
teams from the United Kingdom in the preseason from the English Premier League coming to Trinidad and Tobago. You allow that to build the economy. You, when you have something like that, AstroTurf, you can have advertisements through around that AstroTurf. With and um, with that advertisement, you get you can now get funding out for more lights. With the concept of sport tourism, you are now you can now boost into the economy of getting sport tourism as a factor when it becomes CPL, when it becomes international football teams of the highest level. Getting persons to come here, you get getting sponsors, you're getting um, massive television rights with hundreds of millions of dollars. Nothing like that has been done to generate income by this government as it pertains to sport tourism, because the only thing they know is to tax their way to balance the budget. My bad, my bad. That was me. Look at it, look at the screen again. There's our next question there for you. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same individual who lied and said that I said both UNC and PNM were corrupt. So he have had a, he, he's coming here with an agenda just for Bacchanal. But so let's um there was a lot of interference coming from the government side. Why do you take action in time? Well, do Mr. Man, there's something called evidence. You can't take action unless there's evidence. However, if the government is doing something that is unethical, being unethical doesn't mean that you can arrest government officials. So, for example, if the government will say, look, we are giving you $40 million, put it in the police account, hire persons make them SRPs, and these are the matters they must investigate. Only in a communist country will that be done. Any other country in the world, there will be a call for a new election. So those are things that are unethical, but it's not criminal. Uh, so the, the actions being made by the government, for example, as well, during the COVID pandemic, the, the, there was a concern that I was not arresting persons within their home. The prime minister and I fell out. Because of my training, there's something called an illegal command. Because you're a prime minister, I'm not going to blindly adhere to what you see that is wrong. Because the prime minister did not read and do research to understand public health regulations meant that it gives it doesn't give the police the authority to arrest persons in their home. So if, if three young ladies are in Bayside by their pool and they are there in their area, with their own community, in their own gated area, there's nothing that could be done. Because you had weak police commissioners in like 2011, that arrested hundreds of young men under the state of emergency incorrectly. It meant that it cost the state tens upon tens of millions of dollars. I had no intention to do that. And that is the type of leadership the country needs. People who will stand firm and not allow wrongdoing. So, um, Gary, Russell Chan says the government took over the resident field years ago in Diego Martin, built a stadium and put 10-foot military-type fine fencing and lock out the residents. That is criminal to the residents. Madness. Can yeah, so, so there are tens of millions of dollars for that Diego Martin Stadium. Before that, there were two football fields that the, the, the community could utilize every single day. Immediately now, you want to enhance Diego Martin to the point that the, the average young person now does not have the opportunity to play on that field in Diego Martin. Now, obviously, I understand there, may be, there must be checks and balances. You can't have it like a, like a park. But to block it off and not give the persons in that area, it meant to them, many of them saying, oh, it's best we kept the field like how it was. At least young children could go and play. There were two football fields there before the stadium was built. It allowed us to have the opportunity to play sport. Now, nothing could be done because you have turned that now into a facility similar to the national stadium. And that, and therein lies the problem. Because you, you see, as the one thing that government, when it is the more stadium you build, the more schools that you build uh, and you're double, you're double the price, the Trans Tobago Police Service, for example, the NYPD has less police stations than the Trans Tobago Police Service, and they see about the security of, of tens of millions of persons daily. We see about 1.4, but we have more police stations because politicians love that. They love to build things, mark up the price four times over, and then cut a ribbon, and then whoever is the contractor gets a good markup. That is the type of nonsense that must stop because we believe that every time somebody um, somebody breaks the law, you need to build a police station. And the same thing happened with sport. You do not need to be building a stadium in every single street corner. What, pe what people need is areas where it can allow them to have the opportunity to play, to train, to relax, to walk your dog, to exercise. But you decide to build that stadium in, in, in Diego Martin, and now the, the young persons have very little and nowhere to go. So we have all of these, these five stadiums built that was, that was supposed to be built because of the under-17 World Cup in 1999, I think. And now these stadiums are all dilapidated. They're not being utilized. They have very little value. And now you're building more. But it is that even these present stadiums, are, the stadiums that we have, are not, are not being utilized. It, it, it's bad management. But as I said, governments love that. They love to build these things and increase the price. The police stations, for example, 
you build a police station in, in, in Tobago that could hold 250 people. That's more than the number of all the officers in Tobago. So there will never be a need for that. So again, when you go back to, to New York, some of these police stations are precincts. There's some of them are the size of a container. But we have massive four-story buildings in every single every single area for police. And because, because of that, you have massive tens of millions of month in maintenance costs. I had to cut those costs by stating by 7 p.m., the, the, the other than the first floor where the police will be, all air conditions, all lights will be switched off. That's actually saved the taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. And again, going back to the stadium, you build that, it's, you keep generating and pumping tens of millions to maintain these things. The cost benefit analysis that the, that the village, the community gets from it is virtually non existent. Um, Mr. Griffith, Joel Sprang Winter. I think you addressed that question already, but just could you just answer it for him again? He came in, he came in. Oh, yes, I'm not seeing him. Well, as I mentioned, the, the reason why we why we named it transformation and alliance was to transform the mindset of politics in Trinidad and Tobago. An alliance not just of minds, but also other political parties who may have the same ideologies, principles for good governance. So we will continue to open the door. Uh, it's something that Basio Pandey always try to put a, 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 a government of national unity. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, I, I hope that we can find some avenue to open that window and to allow persons to circle the wagons. Let's work together. Let's see what we can do to achieve. Trying to speak about this, it is my political party and we intend to win alone and we must win alone. I, I beg to differ. Everybody, uh, it, is, it is your right. Um, the UNC, they will have persons who believe it is their right to say that the UNC can win alone. The data will show that that can never happen. Um, but there are persons in the NT that also believe that we are better than anyone else and we must go on our own as well. So it is the right of persons to have their degree of opinion. I am not making a decision as a political leader based on what I feel. That is, I think, has been one of the biggest problems in politics. If a political leader says we're supporting Gary, everybody will agree. If he or she says, you know, we don't like him, 90% of them will, will automatically stop liking him. And that is amazing where, where political parties on both sides would like Gary or don't like Gary, depending on if it is that the political leader is on, in good, on good terms with him. I will ask persons, you mean, sometimes we need to be independent thinkers and not just blindly support our political leader because of the decision that, that he or she makes. So the window will always be open for constant dialogue. Dialogue is effective, is an effective tool towards good governance. And may I, may I also add just finally on that point, um, I, I don't want to make too many comments pertaining to things that we want to do in transformation of the economy, health, national security, because I make a statement and next thing is an alliance. And in that alliance, we, they, we, is that decided that we didn't want to do that. And now I'm committed by making that statement. So uh, I, I have to be very careful of the things that I say, but I'll give you a, a simple example of something that I would like to see, state boards. State boards have been one of the most effective measures of incompetence that you will see, and possibly even corruption, throughout the, the length and breadth of, of Trinidad and Tobago's politics, because everyone who is selected on the state board is not based on qualification. There's no qualifying factor for you to be on a state board. The main thing is what party card you have in your back pocket, and if it equates with the government of the day. And so when these individuals get in a state board, there's no knowledge, training, qualification, or experience in the field of the state board you're in, but you had to get a fix up. And then with that, it may cause a degree of mismanagement, incompetence, and maybe even corruption. I would love to see a system where 10% of all state board members must be members of the opposition to allow checks and balances to prevent mismanagement and incompetence, as well as a basic minimum degree of qualifying for the state board that you're in. But again, that is my personal view. I'm not here to make a statement that next thing is an alliance. They said, but Gary Griffith, you said that. That's why I have to be very careful of policies that, that we would like to see that we do not want to see as yet because we do not know what is going to happen down the road. Now, property tax. I, I want to ask you a specific question about property tax. Does property tax have anything to do with explain your wealth? Um, it, it can to some extent. The, the, it's interesting that you said that. I was the one who drafted the Explain Your Wealth as the Minister of National Security in 2014. I drafted a law for Explain Your Wealth because I realized the police were getting lots of problems trying to target persons who may have been involved in some degree of white collar crime. Because uh, when it is that, again, you have governments that will give criminal elements uh, a $5 million state contract to build a box train that costs $50,000. And then many times it's cash that's been distributed. So it's very difficult. However, we're under explain your wealth, why well, drafted it. If you have three houses valued over $20 million, you have five vessels, you have um, excel, you have 
funds and assets, fixed assets. All we have to do is tell us how you got it. Um, not everyone was pleased in my own government when I decided that because they said, well, I've worked for it. I said, well, that's, this is not to take away anything that you learn, you know. This is to find an avenue to prevent corruption and, why, and to deal with white collar crime. Uh, after I left as Minister of National Security, the incoming government came and the Attorney General Faris Alwari, he just cut and paste exactly what I had, which I had no problem with. This is something that I um, I wanted when I was in government. And that explained your wealth. I don't think it has been as effective as it should, but it, it's along the line of our international inter intelligence agencies pinpointing certain persons, and it could be from a police constable who, based on his salary, it is impossible that he may have that. And sometimes people could, by the way, let's not, whether it is you win the lotto, whether it is inheritance, whether it is that your wife is involved in a business. So this is not to say that based on your salary, it is impossible. What we, what it has, however, it gives us the right to ask, how did you get this? How did you acquire this? And, and that is a good avenue. The property tax, no. The property tax is a, is a system primarily based on trying to find a way for the government to, to lift their income, to offset and balance their expenditure because of poor governance. And that's what they do. The PNM finds the only way they can try to find an, a source of, of um, income is to, is, to, is to find something with taxes. That's all they do. There's nothing as it pertains to investment um, towards trying to divert the, the concept of the economy. I just spoke about sports tourism, for example. Jamaica, Jamaica, their first two months of this year, they acquired one billion US in one ministry alone. That was um, tourism. So you're looking at one billion US, roughly seven million TT um, in, in one ministry alone. So which means that Jamaica's tourism industry, when you multiply that seven by six, you they are going to make they, they so that that what that Jamaica makes is almost is more than Trinidad and Tobago's annual budget in everything that we have done in all the ministries. And we do not ever see anything as an income generator. Health is another perfect example. We can utilize health towards final income generators similar to other places that put focus on all sorts of things from lipo, from um, from um, dealing with, with um, certain medical things like cancer and so forth. We only see the Ministry of Health as something that you must spend money on and you get nothing in return. That is when you have a government that does not think out of the box. So the property tax is a, sim is a simple example as that. My concept, as I said, when you have a 50, 60 billion dollar budget, the police service alone, I was able to reduce 300 million TT annually in overtime corruption because we had over 200 police officers claiming they were working 24 hours a day, 30 days a month, 70,000 TT a month. And then that was being obviously somebody else who was signing was getting a cut. When I, when I reduced that, when I reduced the fact to stop police vehicles, one vehicle being refueled to top up four times for the day, you know it's, you're topping up your own vehicle. When it is that you had certain areas where every time a police vehicle is done, you're going by a certain garage who's your friend and, and it might be a small part to change and next thing it's a whole overhaul and I'm getting a bill for $100,000. That is how you clean up the country by reducing wastage, reducing corruption and now by doing that, by reducing your expenditure, there's no need now for you to find another source of income to lift your income to balance it with the expenditure. And that's what they're doing right now. They see the importance of property tax to lift, to balance with the expenditure. Expenditure. Find a way to reduce your expenditure through the corruption, incompetence, mismanagement, and possible corruption. You know, I, I didn't understand, right? When I hear the Minister of Finance talk about the problem with property tax is some people not got to explain your wealth. And I was saying to myself, well, many of us here in America pay property tax. Many of us. And I didn't understand how you could make the leap with if I am, um, I have five properties, right? And you ain't asked me nothing, but I'm paying my property tax, going and paying exactly. my property tax. Exactly. Oh, oh. Listen, listen, I Colin, Colin Imbert has shortcomings, not just height, but shortcomings as it pertains to common sense. The property tax can never be seen as a generator towards an avenue to align the person to being corrupt. I drafted the Explain Your Wealth. I did it. So I know the importance of it. And the explain your wealth is based on the intelligence agencies pinpointing that this gang leader, this police constable, this politician right. has yeah. X, Y, and Z, but we know that his salary is this. And you get that primarily from the integrity commission by persons in public office. When you yeah. do that, you can now target and say, listen, sir, there's nothing, we are not accusing you of anything, but we realize you have five houses. We realize that you have eight, um, eight Mercedes 
And all we're asking is, how did you get this? That is all. But that, but property tax is not an avenue for that because anybody who has a house and you're paying the property tax for it, that is not an avenue to pin for you to be in a criminal element. That is the height of stupidity is because Colin Inbert never looked at the draft of what I did from the Explainer Wealth and that Faris Alwari refurbished towards their law being sent out. But, but, but Gary, when yeah. you listen, when you listen to some of them on the RPNM, the RPNM radio host and activist, them was like, yeah, we understand now why people questioning the property tax. And I have to say this, eh, the only place in the world where people want to pay property tax is PNM people in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and 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 reminds me now. Um, sorry for going back, but it was known as civil asset forfeiture. That was the draw. That was the law that I drafted. Civil asset forfeiture because I did immense research in different countries in the world. And civil asset forfeiture was a was a system where we can seize your assets if you can't account for how you acquired your assets. So that was a big hit. And then that's when Faris Alwari changed it to explain your wealth. But civil asset forfeiture is the one thing. Whatever you have, and they're not going to. That is not going to. To target you as a criminal because of the property tax that you pay. That is stupidity. There's going to be a system because uh, people have property tax they pay because of a massive mortgage that they have, because of their wife or, or, or inheritance or whatever. Or you may very well be a very successful businessman. So all of that, because of you paying property tax, is not a way to measure and target you of being involved in criminal activity. That is totally unacceptable. There's a caller that just somebody just wrote and asked. What do I intend to do with persons who may have some degree of relevance um, in trying to improve the country to be part of the NTA? I said it from day one. The NTA is not one that I would like to have a government that the only persons who must be in an NTA government because you are, you are a political member of the NTA. This is what Trinidad and Tobago we do constantly and probably most countries in the world. You win an election, whether it is red or yellow, what happens is that 50% of the country becomes totally isolated and you cannot use the expertise of those individuals because they have the wrong party card. So what happens is that if we need the top four persons for, for, for positions, it means that by and large, it will be the first and the third qualified persons that will get it. The second and fourth will not be eligible because of their party card. So now you're gonna get inferior quality persons fill any breach for these positions, whether it be state board, cabinet or whatever, because of the party card affiliation. So in the positions of state boards or whatever, we do not get the best minds available because we totally eliminate half because of the party card that they have. If it is that you do not want to contribute to the development of the country because you're not a member of the NTA or UNC or the PNM, that's fine. My concept is that I want to get the best minds available regardless of your political party card to assist in the development of Trinidad and Tobago. I have seen so many square pegs and wrong holes in and out of cabinet that, have, have, that, has, that would have destroyed so many things that could have assisted the development of our country. I think we need to stop that. Now, what exactly is the NTA's position on the property tax? Well, well, as I said, it is difficult for me to, to give my impression. And next thing you know, I say that, and then there's an alliance, and the alliance comes with a template of this is where we're going with in the pre-election campaign. People are then going to come back and tell Gary, but you said that. And so I have to be very careful of the comments that I make the, as it pertains to the NTA, at present, as I said, I do not see the value for property tax if it is that you can treat it, be a good government. Stop all of this thing with mismanagement. Look at the Brand Lara Stadium, gentlemen. We're speaking about a 7 million US stadium that you end up that costs 200 million US. But when you do things like that, there's no need for property tax. And that is my point. So if we have a $60 billion TT budget, we could very well have a budget down to 50 billion TT without needing the property tax to balance your budget, while it's not affecting production pro uh, and uh, productivity, sorry. And that is so that is the angle I would like to see. As I said, I did it with the police service. We were able to save hundreds and hundreds of million dollars a year based on um, stopping corruption, corruption from overtime, corruption from police officers doing extra duties, corruption from fuel, um, refueling vehicles, corruption from taking police vehicles, carrying in a garage, who you may know, and then as soon as I left, everything started back again. So now the country is, is now being forced to pay hundreds upon hundreds of millions based on police corruption or mismanagement because of improper leadership and, and accountability. 
if we did, we are going back to what I did, then the police would have been able to not say, well, we don't have enough money to change the uniform. We have the police service in a uniform like look like security guards. They don't have the proper tasers, the proper body cameras, the dashboard cameras on the vehicles, the type of units, the training, the technology that they need. And that is and in customer service training. So because of that, the police is collapsing and are not being as successful as they would have been. No fault of the police officers. They are not being given the tools because of bad management, bad governance. So if it is that that is done across the board in all the ministries, you can actually cut, as I said, probably several billion dollars through inefficiency, incompetence, mismanagement, and even corruption. And then you will not need the property tax to balance the budget. So here's a question someone sent me. And some question for Gary. What he and his wife plan for children that live in orphan homes, instead of putting them out on streets to the wolves, why not build a halfway home until 25? Remember, they put them out at 18. That's why so many crimes out there. No, no, I, I, that's a very good point. And again, it's something that uh, you don't see why this government doesn't put a proper approach to look after it. Uh, we, we have gone through the same basic thing. We call it we call it MILAC, we call it MIPAD, we call it CCC, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps. And there's so little that is done for young persons after they leave. Uh, at, at 18, you're an adult, you have to fend for yourself. And if it is, again, going back, to the, uh, to the element of all of these different projects that governments have done. And they call it all sort of fancy things, hundreds of millions of dollars pumped into it. If we utilize those same funds, and again, going back to the CPEP and all of these different things where over hundred million is spent. If you remove that and take away the, the, the middleman who has been involved in, as I said, you're paying, you're paying 5 million US to build a $50,000 box drain. You eliminate all of that. You can actually give every single young person uh, an unemployment check, uh, something similar you could look at to, to Canada, where at least they have something to pay their bills, to eat a meal, and probably to assist them in a development uh, system to direct them into finding something, some niche market that has their talent. And many young persons do not ever understand what is their talent because they were never given that opportunity. And that is very unfortunate. I, and it goes right back a simple example of something known as ADHD. ADHD with young, I think it's the United States, 7% of boys ADHD. And in Trinidad, and that, and because the United States education system is so mature, they understand that when you have ADHD, we understand it is not an ailment, it is not a sickness. Many of the, some of the top, some most successful persons in the world have ADHD. But the ADHD means that you need to find that, that not common cure, but that, that niche that you are so good at that you will spend all of your time and energy and make you the best that you can be. The owner of Virgin Atlantic, so many different people have um, top, some of the top footballers in the world, ADHD. But because they're in Trinidad and Tobago, let me tell you what happens here. You, you, you have ADHD, it means that you, you can't sit down in a classroom for five hours. So what they, what they do immediately, you're talkative, you're a troublemaker, you'll never get anywhere in school and life. My son had ADHD. And then because I was able to do, I had the facility to do the background. What we did is allow, the, the teachers allowed him in the school after every hour, he just had to sprint from one end of the, the corridor to the other, just to burn his energy and sit down. And with that, it allowed him to concentrate. That is not a fault. And, and, and that is where it is, we need to improve our whole standard of governance. So the, what the, the person spoke about is not just about uh, what happens after they're 18. It's our whole education system that needs revamping. And because we lose probably 7% of our uh, um, young adult population going in the wrong direction because we have totally misunderstood, misunderstood the concept of how you deal with young persons suffering from ADHD. 7% here, you're speaking about, so for every 100 young men, at least seven, and women as well, ADHD, but more boys, seven out of 100 could go the wrong direction because of bad systems in our education system. So, so... Anyway, let me ask this question. Highly asked question. Can your sports strategy generate revenue locally without the help of foreign government donations? Yeah, I, I just mentioned that. I spoke about CPL. Guyana, it got an injection of over 100 million US for the CPL over the last three years when they had CPL, the semifinals and finals. When we have CPL here in Trinidad and Tobago, we have 20,000 uh, persons in probably the, the, the most popular cricket ground in this part of the world, Queen's Park Oval. Those 20,000 people will now go out and be spending hundreds of dollars, especially foreigners who come to Trinidad 
to be able to go to the bars, the nightclubs, the taxis, the restaurants. That is what that is how you inject the economy, just sports tourism alone with CPL. Similar to um, if it is that we fix our stadium in a proper manner, we have a proper system. Why is it that the English Premier League, when the Manchester United, the Liverpools, the Arsenal, the Chelsea's, when they leave at the end of the season, why do they always have to go to the United States to play into Miami? No, they want to go in a, in a warm climate, but why not come to Trinidad and Tobago? You bring a, one of those these teams here, you're going to generate hundreds of millions that you could be getting annually from uh, media rights and so forth. So all of those things, but the AstroTurf that we have, we have the only AstroTurf in the Southern Caribbean that can be used for international hockey and other types of sport. So the point being is that sport tourism can put a major injection in providing income to assist the balance of the budget. Another simple avenue to prevent you feeling that it is mandatory to tax your way to balance a budget. Yeah, I, we um, we never ever, when they started with the property tax, by the way, um, Sir Griffith, um, Colin Booth stood up in the parliament and said the property tax was 2.7%. And I told him, no, it's not 2.7%. And I told him, I said, give me any number and assess value, annual rental value, and I will figure out the tax using 3%. And then Brian Manning went on a radio station and said, um, well, she don't know what you're talking about, that Trinidad and Tobago had one of the lowest property tax in the Western Hemisphere. And I was asking myself, but wait now, I wonder if United States in the Western Hemisphere. I wonder if all them Caribbean highlands is the Western Hemisphere. Maybe I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't too good at geography or I missed something. And we yeah. had to tell them, we had to tell them that the tax is regressive and oppressive, right? And still at 2%. And this is our opinion here. For example, yeah. my next door neighbor to me here, don't pay the same percentage as I do. My next door neighbor across there, don't pay the same percentage as I do. And in my opinion, everybody shouldn't be paying 2% tax across the board. Because houses in, the, in, in, in America, it's all about location, location, location. Location, yeah. And you know, and, and let me add something. You know, there's a, a video done by Vasan Barrett, and it was very interesting and factual. Yeah, I saw if, it. Yeah. If there was, if there was the slightest, the slight perception that by putting this property tax, it is going to ensure now that the country will be able to get the type of resources needs that are required. People say maybe okay, you know, but it's not going to happen. All that this is is another avenue to inject income into into the government that is going to be mismanaged, misused, and you're going to have the same high crime rate. You're going to have the same bad roads. You're going to have the same um, improper water supply because the money that you're going to get is not going to be the avenue towards assisting you in improving your incompetence. So having the same square pegs in the wrong holes is not going to assist Shampa Kujo in getting our national sporting teams to develop better. It's not going to affect um, Ralph, um, um, Mr. Gonzalez in getting a system where the vast majority of the country do not have a 24-hour water supply. It is not going to assist in improving the standard of our police service to reduce crime. So that is the problem. You're asking the country to put their hands in their pocket, put out more towards improving and increasing your budget allocation but we are not going to get a, an increased deliverable in the needs of, of in the goods and services that we require that you are supposed to be given to us. So all that it is, and so in other words, in a, in a year's time, they're going to find something else to tax. And they, they keep increasing taxes, whether it is fuel, whether, whatever it is, and you're not seeing an increase in the overall improvement in goods and services. Well, the Minister of Finance said that's why we that's why they bring in property tax so you could get more water, so you could get water now. You know, yeah, but remember they said that when, they, when every time they increase fuel, they yeah. said that for everything and they said they didn't riot as yet. So what when all of these increases in taxes came, where was the improvement in the delivery of goods and services? What it is that you could tell us that is that's gonna give us the perception that by this now is going to improve it. You're not. You continue to increase your expenditure through incompetence, mismanagement, corruption, and maybe even uh, as I said, corruption. But you're not trying to show us that by increasing your income, it is going to make sure that you're going to get an improvement in your goods and services. Well, I can, go ahead, Tommy. No, I'm a bit late, but I have these two questions for you, Mr. Griffiths. I wanted to know what's your take on what has been going on with the SSA, number one, and number two, the spill in Tobago and how it's being managed and handled. What's your take on these two topics 
Sure, well, with the SSA, this is this has yet again been an avenue to show that the Prime Minister believes that as the chair of the National Security Council, he has some dictatorial authority as pertains to national security, which is what he did when he tried to influence me to say that you know we should arrest persons within their homes, which would have been not just unethical but illegal. And the same thing when it is he pumped funds and then told us to utilize these funds to target persons polit um, of political opponents. In this situation, with the SSA, it is no different. The man had the audacity recently to say that cabinet never gave the approval for the SSA to carry firearms. Oh, you cannot be as, you can't be dumber than that. You're a politician. You can never give approval through cabinet to approve any arm of the state to have firearms. This is, this is not a communist state. So for you to say that, it shows you don't even understand your role and function. For you to make an amendment, it has to go in law in parliament. And that is the, and it's the same thing with the firearms act when he and I had the issue. He kept lying and saying that there's a government policy for Firearms Act. The day he could show me that government policy, I will resign in politics tomorrow. That is a lie. There's no such thing as government policy for a Firearm Act. So going back to the SSA, what he has done is try to give the impression that the government must have the be all and end all in the, in the operational aspect of it. And the SSA is similar to the CIA. Let's put it to you all from a lower level, obviously. But the CIA, you think that that White House needs to give approval for a member of the CIA to carry a firearm? You can't be that dumb. But his impression is always, see if I could play a game of aha, we catch him this time. And he keeps trying and it co and continues to cause mass mayhem, confusion. So you, you, target, you targeted the head of the Integrity Commission, the Industrial Court, the Commissioner of Police, the Director of the SSA. Every single person who seems to have an, an independent voice, even the judge, there was a judge recently that was accurate when J Justice Sipasad said, that the, that the commissioner of police based on laziness was saying, well, I didn't have time to sign someone's FUL, FUL because I was busy. Madness, right? But the, and what, what the judge said is that you, you have a right to have athletes said yes or no. The prime minister says he doesn't agree with the judge because the judge has to understand government policy. Are you crazy? That has nothing to do with government policy. It means that if you hold a position of authority in the state and you are given a document by a citizen, you better find time and actually said, yes, I'm approving it, or no, I'm not approving it. And if you don't approve it, he can then go to the appeals board. But don't be so lazy that for several years you didn't reply. And that is what caused the problem in being firearms. 25,000 applicants, none even being the common courtesy to even acknowledge because we had commissioners before me that probably never went and arranged in years because they don't understand how to use a firearm or the importance of it for a law-abiding citizen. So the SSA situation, it's just a whole set of bacchanal that has been done in no other way other than to try to find an avenue. Look, this fellow not going to adhere to my 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 tune, sing to my tune, or dance to my tune. I need to move him, just as he did with the industrial quartet, just as he did with the integrity commission, just as he did with the commissioner of police, just as he did now with the head of the SSC. That is what you call democratic dictatorship, where it is we have a democratic country, but because of our constitution being so flawed, it allows one man, one man that virtually handpicks the, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the President of the country, the Chief Justice, all members of State Board, all members of Cabinet, the Commissioner of Police, the Director of the SSC, and the Chief of Defense Staff. Is that, if that is not a dictatorial country, I don't know what is. Um, the other question you asked, but I'm you, yeah, I'm and, and again, it goes back um, as the Minister of National Security back in 2015 and the Commissioner of Police, we are the systems for a proper drone. And that drone would have been able to turn night into day. We'd be able to lock and, and monitor certain things that would be happening. Anything that enters the country, we can immediately pinpoint it, target it, lock on it, and have the Coast Guard have an immediate interception. We we had a national operations center to do just that. All of these things were dismantled, shut down, and removed. We had uh, I was able to acquire vessels to lock down this country at a cost of 1.2 billion TT less than the same vessels they were bringing from the OPVs. That was shut down. Those vessels have remained in Stubbles, in Chagaramas, parked up for the last 10 years because of, again, bad mind. Gary Griffith built, uh, acquired it. We're not using it. If those things were all implemented, we would have been able to get that preemptive strike. You can't tell me something of that. Suppose that was uh, something with nuclear devices on it. How could you see something that entered that and nobody knows about it? That is why we have a problem at our porous borders. Dealing with that, the U.S. Embassy confirmed with me that 97 or 95 percent of our illegal weapons enter the country through the legitimate ports of entry because not be, so it's not because of the porous borders from the 
illegal ports of entry, but because we do not have a proper border protection unit. And we lose about 10 containers annually that leave our ports without even being checked. So as much as the police will seize about 700 firearms a year, one container could have 7,000 firearms. So what the police would have seized in 10 years internally could get back out onto the streets in one night. And Colin Embert has the audacity to say, <clears throat> we can't do anything about it because it will cause a backlog in the containers being cleared. So, we, so be it. So, so what? The most fundamental rights of citizens is safety and security. If it means that your container will be held back a week or two to make sure that every single thing in that container is checked, let us do so. I got mobile scanners to check to see if weapons are found in vehicles and containers. They shut that down as well. So yeah, that system with the barge is just goes right back to the degree of incompetence by this government. And even with the situation with the four divers, I drafted the policy and to get the cabinet note for what is known as a UAV, an un un unmanned um, aerial vehicle underwater <clears throat> that could have played a big part towards possibly seeing what was happening and find an avenue to be able to have assisted those divers nothing was there everyone twiddled their thumbs because the national operations center that i drafted and implemented and established based on the approval and the recommendation by the commission of inquiry into the attempted coup in 1990 it has been put, it has been shut down as well and had there been that noc we would have been able to get real-time information real-time decisions by persons with that with really qualification, not civilians in a place twiddling their thumbs and not knowing what to do, whilst whilst these guys they were losing oxygen. No, no, Gary, there are some people, right, who asked the question. Um, they said that based on the amount of FUL that was issued, right, have any of those FUL responded in any type of criminal activities or criminal behaviors? You know, I, I mean a certain percentage. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good point. You see, and it again shows the ignorance of Fitzgerald Hines and Keith Rowley. Because you increase numbers, that doesn't mean that it increases the chance of, of the wrong persons getting firearms. In fact, that is what happened before me, because persons were getting firearms based on who had contact with the commissioner, who close to this minister, and they will come up and they will fast track it. I refuse to do that. Every single person who wanted to get a firearm, it must go through the 10 division commanders. So again, Keith Rowley lied. To, and you know, people are always afraid to say they lied because you're afraid to get sued. Keith Rowley lied. He lied last week in misinformation with the prime minister when he said that I took away the authority from the, the, the super the divisional heads. To start with, the authority only lies to, to sign with the commission of police, Keith. Keith Rowley needs to spend more time reading the laws than playing golf four days a week. So you'll understand that before he makes these stupid comments, how incorrect it is. That stayed with the heads of the division. You did the due diligence, you did the background check, you go to the homes, you speak to the friends of the individual, you speak to the spouse. Then you had three months to bring it up to the firearm compliance unit. When we did all of that, that minimized, if not eliminated, the possibility that the wrong persons will get the firearms. And that is why in my three years, I gave out 6,000 firearms out of 25,000. 6,000 or 25,000. And in that 6,000, 3,000 were to law enforcement officials, police officers, fires, firemen, customs, um, army, prison officers, past and present, who lives were at risk. And you had a problem with that? And out of those 3,000 civilians, that is 0.3% of the population, 0.3%. And this lunatic is telling the country, Gary, Gary's concept was to liberally give firearms to everybody. How could 0.3% of the population be given out to everyone? And the hypocrisy of him is that he's the same one that was harassing me to get a firearm dealership for a partner he knows in Tobago or somebody he knows in Tobago to sell more firearms. And between himself, a minister, and, a, and an acting commissioner of police, between the three of them, they asked me to get firearms for over 60 odd persons. If we do, if I did that for all the ministers, that would be over 700 firearms per annum. And I was giving out 2,000. So it shows how clueless he is in when he, he made those statements. And in that three year period, because of the stringent system that I had, not one was lost, not one was stolen, not one was used for a crime because we had the FUL card with a chip and the chip now will ensure that if at any time there's a report made at a police station for domestic violence, it can immediately be red, red flagged to the FUL department to do that, hey, we had to seize this guy's firearm if the wife just reported that, that he beat her. That is how professional we had. They removed the card, they removed the chip, they went back to the old time days, no compliance unit, so the wrong people could be getting firearms. So that's why I could boast that in my era, no weapon was lost, stolen, or used for a crime. In fact, dozens upon dozens of lives were saved. 
and he had a problem with it. But then to state that the concept of my system was too liberal, if I had I continued giving out 2,000 firearms a, a year, in, in the three years I gave out 6,000, and there were 25,000 applicants, it meant they would have taken 12 to 15 years before the backlog would have even been completed. And you see that as being a problem. And the lies continued when he said that 64,000 firearms came into the country. Why would any firearm dealer bring in 64,000 firearms if I am only issuing 2,000? That meant it would have taken 32, 32 years before they would have been able to sell the asset. By that time, it's a musket. Nobody will want it. So it shows that what he does, which he's good at, say the same lie over and over and hope people will believe you. Well, I tell you, you know, because I was, um, I hear, hear. No, no, Gary, with that F you all thing, right? There is something about, um, they stopped the prime minister from reading out something in the parliament. Ah, yeah. Can you bring us up to date on that? Yes, certainly, yes, certainly. The one thing he really knows and he's bright about is the one place that you can lie and not be sued is in parliament. So that's what he did with email gate. He got his piece of paper with 17 typographical errors, knowing that it was typewritten and not an email, and then read it out in parliament to smear the character of others. That's what he's good at. But he knows now because I've sued him for about four other matters, and he will go in court and be cross-examined to explain why did you try to smear my character with lies. So what only I'll be in a banana republic will people think that a government with politicians can handpick people close to them, give them a big job, pay them big money, the state that is, and then let them do an audit or a report on a matter of possible criminal activity. This is not, this is not a, a communist state. So you as a, a state hire people, pay them the big money, which means you, they will be, if I'm being paid, I would probably want to give you exactly what you want to hear and then read it out and then say, look what I heard about the person. So my point is, you didn't even have the common courtesy to speak to me about that report. So these persons who did the audit to show how incompetent, they're either incompetent or they had a deliberate agenda. How could you do an audit? Have you ever heard an audit being done in a company? And the head of the company was never questioned because I would be able to show every single thing you are stating is a lie. So they didn't speak to me. So under natural justice to start with, you cannot reveal a report without even speaking to the person who would have been able to say this, this, and that is a lie. The second thing is, when it says you read out these things, it's all, it is alleged, we are, it has been reported, and we have been told. That is all it takes to smear the character and turn out to be, you know, good rum shop talk. So the point being is that if you want to read out anything about me based on you hiring people to speak about me, don't go in parliament like a coward and lie, say it out in public. And that is what this was about. This was about him, why would you want to go to parliament to read a report? This is not a law that needed amended, you know. This is a report that you, that the state handpicked people to be so incompetent, not even to speak to the head of the department, myself, and then you write a report. So you wanted, he wanted to read it out but he knew that if he said it outside, I would have sued him for every single golf club he had, and he wouldn't be able to play golf again. <clears throat> so what he wanted to do was to go to Parliament. So Parliament is the one place on the side you could lie and read it out. And that is the issue that I'm speaking about. Because notice, after three years, these people are civilians, you know, these people are civilians with no law enforcement authority. But in three years, not one person has even been questioned as it pertains to any corrupt activity pertaining to firearms. So how come it could be such a massive, well-oiled criminal industry? And after three years, not one conviction, not one charge, not one arrest, not one person question, to the desperation that what they did was to send police officers to Barbados to kidnap a Trinidad and Tobago citizen in Barbados. And he has now sued Barbados as well because Barbados sadly got bad information. And the only person who could have allowed police officers to leave the country to go ahead and do that would be a senior government minister. And I promise you, the day we get in government, I'm doing an, an immediate investigation to have that minister questioned for possible misconduct in office by aiding and abetting in committing a kidnapping. So Gary, is the NTA gonna go up for all 41 constituency? We are not too sure. Um, as I said, the role of a political party is to get in government and to be in politics. So as it is right now, the UNC said it. They, they said that they are opening for all 41 candidates in all 41 constituencies, sorry. We may very well do the same. If and when the time comes of a possible alliance, that is when it will give and take will, will take place. So if the, the candidate for constituency X, if it's NTA, and UNC wants to have that candidate take part, 
that 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 UNC that NTA candidate might now support the UNC candidate to provide them with the previous ONRs, NAR, COP voters to help them. That is what happened in the local government election. When I walked the length and breadth of the country in Trinidad, um, in all of the hills, and which was interesting, I went and <coughs> excuse, I went to the 31 hardest seats, the, the 31 safest seats that the PNM had, walking the length and breadth of the corridor from all up in Scorpion and Carnage. Um, Simeon Road in, in Cooker, uh, all of the hills in Cookerit, Paramin, um, going all up in the hills in Lavantil, Silots, Beatum, uh, all through the hills in St. Joseph, Tunapuna, the hills in Arima, the length and breadth of San Fernando and San Grande. What happened in San Fernando, for example, wasn't because there was a that that there was a greater increase in UNC support. It would have been NTA voters knowing that there was an alliance with the UNC that they voted for the UNC candidate. So again, and some people have been mischievous to say, for example, in San Fernando, the UNC said they got 10,000 votes in the local government in 2020. But then in 2023, they got um, 9,000. Um, 9, what they said is, look, well, the NT didn't bring extra votes. No, there was massive disenchantment and discontent by the voting population that moved from 34 to 30%. But had it not been for the NTA, the UNC would not have acquired the 9,000. It, it may have been... 8,000 or something. So we were able to make sure we brought back persons to the table. That's why PNM lost 33,000 votes from 2019 local government, but the UNC we lost 10,000 because we were able to get, bring back those disenchanted UNC voters or the NTA previous COP voters to vote for the UNC candidates in those other 110 seats. That is the type of alliance that will always cause the PNM to be defeated in a unification. As I said, it happened in 1986. It happened in 1995, it happened in 2010, and it is going to happen in 2025 if there's that type of strategic alliance. Yes, so, so, Gary. Go ahead, Tommy. Gary, we, we have to be careful that the wrong messages aren't sent to the voting population, that there are dissension among the, the, the partners. And I'm saying that to say that it has to be clear that the cooperation with the various parties exists before the election, the actual election takes place. Because if there, if there are misinformation or should I say misconceptions about the unity not being strong, it will cost the alliance as opposed to enhancing the alliance. Agreed 100%. And that is why, you know, sometimes people are afraid for confrontation. I do, I believe in transparency. I'm not going to, you see what happened in 2010 is what caused that. Um, there were five political leaders. They went to Faisabad and signed a piece of paper. That cannot be an alliance. That cannot be an alliance of minds. And all that we are saying is let us deal with the issues now. Let us make sure that the public understands that we intend to trash out and deal with these issues, and it is not going to be a marriage of convenience. So this is not about the NTA just bringing our voters to come and vote for the UNC candidate for there to be a UNC government. We in there, we've done that. What we are asking is that there must be some degree of mutual respect. There must be some degree of dialogue, but as well as all NTA candidates and voters must understand and respect the value of the UNC because they have 19 seats. They have the majority of the voters, but in the same manner, what the, those the, those bridge constituency voters want is to ensure that this is not a case of us just voting for UNC candidates for it to be a UNC government, and the third parties have no say in the running of the government, which is what happened with the COP. And this is not in any way to attack or discredit the UNC for what happened. There was a breakdown in communication, and my style of leadership may be different to Winston Lucrano, Prakash Ramadan, not knocking them for what they did. But the concept is that I am stating that I intend to make sure that the problems that existed in 2010 to 2015, we trash it out now. And by us trashing it out now, the country will now believe that this is going to be sustainable. It will be long lasting. It will have mutual respect. It will be genuine. And then it will ensure towards making sure that this is going to be the best government this country would have seen in decades. You now, Gary, with the NTA still being a coalition of the UNC, if PEP is part of that coalition? Well, there's no coalition right now. Um, as I said, uh, right now there is no coalition. Um, the alliance is something that worked for the local government election. We need to get back to the drawing board to ascertain who would be part of the of this new alliance. 
the one thing that I, I listened to Kamala Prasad be says her comments, and it is true, I will agree with her, that all political parties being part of this alliance must be assessed to verify that they, they would not be in any way a, a party that is going to cause issues. And that's inclusive of the NTA. So we must be assessed. The UNC must be assessed as well, because it's not a case of the UNC being the bigger party so that they are just assessing anybody who comes in. And that's why when I keep hearing the, the, the comments, um, if you're not with the UNC, then you're PNM. I can say the same thing about the NT. If you're not supporting with the NT, then you're PNM. We can't be going down that road. The, the goal is greater than the sum of the parts. We must circle the wagons. And by doing that, it cannot be seen that I am the big brother and we will just follow. Everybody comes under the umbrella of the UNC. That is not going to get us into government. There will always be that bridge constituency of that 150,000 odd that will not want to vote for the PNM or the UNC. They will be forced to either or if there's no bridge constituency. This election there is. So it means that people will have a choice. And if it's that choice, we need to make sure that there's going to be that degree of mutual respect to ensure that it works and it is long lasting and there's a proper foundation to prevent it from collapsing. So, so Gary, Gary, I like that answer. You're, giving, you know, you're, you're on my wrong body. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think of <laughs> No, but, but, but I'm serious that there's, there's no decision that can be made until we, we come up to our rules of engagement. To yeah, but listen to this. But Gary, listen to this. We, we speculate in here. We're going on the New York Stock Exchange. I work on the New York Stock Exchange for 23 years, and I speculate in here. We speculate, right? Let's say the UNC decide that PEP is going to be part of the unification, Right? talking about just before the general election the decision was made and they say pep is going to be part of the unification what says you about the nta being part of that unification no well then there's not a unification the unc can't say that and that's the point i'm trying to state if there are stakeholders who want to be part of an alliance of minds to get into government the unc can't say that this we want this and you have no say in the matter then we are no then it becomes no different to the government of 2010 to 2015 that's my point Anytime that type of arrangement is made with the UNC saying we will decide who is in and who is out, well, then we are now we have now become silent partners, similar to what is still happening in the COP in 2010 to 2015. The country they don't want that. Those COP voters do not want to be silent partners to be told who will come in, who will come out, um, and you are we alone will be assessed. There must be some degree of equality, uh, equity, sorry, where every single political party must be respected must you, they, you must understand the role and function and importance of that party if at any time there's that perception that we are not important and you don't need us well then go ahead that that is your right and i, I respect you for that and we will go ahead and you will most probably get the results of 2000 of 1981 1991 and 2007. you provide some degree and i think that is what caused the problems in 1986 and 2010 where there was there, there was a a, a cosmetic political marriage of convenience and that is what we don't want we also don't want political domestic violence where even with the nta we can't be bullying the unc or vice versa so what should happen is that i want to make sure we can unify all of these political parties and mind you this is when we get in government it is not in any way to target the pnm but to try to work with the pnm in trying to help develop Trinidad and tobago so last question for me Right, there are some who says that in your in your past incarnation, you had said that you was gonna run against Dr. Rowley in, in Digo Martin. And now we see that you are gonna run in St. Joseph instead. Why the change your mind? Everything in life is strategy and tactics. The concept is that who virtually it happens, who wins St. Joseph wins the election. PNM could bring could find Barack Obama and bring him with Gary Griffith. They, 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 they curtail book especially in a, a two horse race. So it was, it's all based on strategy and the importance of strategy. Um, as I said, you win St. Joseph, you win the election. So that is the importance of that seat. And bearing in mind that, as I said, I spent almost half of my life in St. Joseph on three occasions, three occasions, I was about to be the candidate for St. Joseph for the UNC. That was in 2007, I was about to be the candidate by Basio Pandit to replace Jerry Etming. And then the COP was formed and everything collapsed. In 2014, I was the candidate to go up against um, um, Terence Dial Singh in the by-election, but there was a concern that because of the votes possibly being split with Omlala representing the ILP, 
um, they asked me to pull back to wait until 2015 general election. And then just before 2015 general election, we had a system when, when I was no longer minister. So on three occasions, I've been involved in that Valley of Death in St. Joseph. So I understand St. Joseph well. I understand the nature of St. Joseph. I, I lived half my life there in St. Joseph in Val St. Paul. So and as I said, um, they, they, there's absolutely no way that the PNM could defeat me uh, at all, especially in a two-horse race. If it becomes a two-horse race, so so be it. If um, if not, well, then it's going to be, uh, as I said, it's going to be very difficult. Not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult because the UNC continues to say it is possible that they could win alone, even though the, the history has shown that has never happened um, in a three-horse race. But every single political leader would. It is your right to say that we could win all 41 seats. That, that's your right. I, I Being realistic, um, I know the importance of St. Joseph. Um, maybe and hopefully this can even be an avenue to assist in the alliance of the political parties. And by doing that, the UNC may very well want to go for another very critical marginal seats. And I will ensure that all the NTA supporters would support that UNC candidate to make sure that they win. It, 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 it's really straightforward. Um, so that I think that that sums up that that question. All right. So um, Stephen says, "Hello, Gary. What's in place for a fair election in 2025?" Well, you know, unlike 2023, where the Prime Minister deliberately refused to bring in international observers for a general election, that um, that that is done. And to Fox Islam, up to now, not every single question that has been asked I have answered. Maybe it is beyond your intellectual capacity to have understood what I was stating. So next time I'll draw photos for you. <laughs> oh, God. All right, last question from Hailey. Hailey says, question, how are you going to convince the poor voters who vote PNM to them, even though PNM is of no value to them? Well, again, going to the same way that when I walked, as I said, Lavantil, Silots, Beatum, uh, all of the, the volatile hotspot PNM areas, they have never seen their political leader there. Most of them have never even seen their member of parliament. So they were shocked to see a political leader walk in in these areas, as I said, Simeon Road of the Hills in, in, in Karanaj, Paramin, um, um, so, sorry, Simeon Road in, uh, um, in Kokorit, um, Scorpion, all in Karanaj, Lavantil, and all these places. The, and that is my point. I am accessible. I am, intend to prove to them the same way I was the only crazy public, public service official that gave his personal phone number to each and every citizen to let them know if you have a problem with crime, talk to me personally if you don't trust anyone else. I intend to give them the same promise. I intend to walk the length and breadth of Trinidad and make myself accessible. It's something that the PNM hierarchy have never done because they've used them, they've utilized them. I'm not saying it's going to cause us to win Lavantil and Port of Spain, but this is definitely going to ensure that we win the marginals. And that who wins the marginals wins the election. So that is why it is I intend to convince those persons you have nothing to lose. It can't get any worse to how they have treated you. So we intend to provide you with that opportunity. Just believe and give us that opportunity. I, I, Gary, I, Gary, I gotta say, every time you come in, it's always a pleasure, man. Somebody just said Valsin is a big shot area, but you know, you know, and this is hypocrisy of callers. Yeah, but where Keith Robbie lives, up in um, Goodwood Park, is also a big shot area. And that's why he has, when I walk through the length and breadth of Carnage in School Street in Scorpion, they have never, never seen him in 30 years. But you're speaking about big shot area. You know why? Because he stays from up in his house in Goodwood Park and then walks with, and goes with four special branch armored vehicles to play golf four days a week in Mocha. Gary, any closing words before you go? No, it, it has been a pleasure, gentlemen. Um, I hope that it would have cleared some, some matters. I, I, unfortunately, I am a little tied in trying to say much more than I should, than I could, because, as I said, with a possibility of an alliance, I can't be going out and giving plans and policies that can next thing, it will pull back and people say, but Gary, you said so and so, why are you changing your mind now? So it is difficult. What we are doing, however, we are forming a transformational road back towards the development of Trinidad and Tobago. So the same way I was able to transform the police service, we intend to do for every arm in the public sector. But that needs buy-in with all of the alliance of parties. And I think that is going to be the engine room to align the parties. That transformational roadmap that we can all agree to that can assist in transforming Trinidad and Tobago. Gary, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That was a pleasure. My pleasure. Take care.
Take yes, care. Bye. Take care.